Hello again everyone and welcome back to Trick Bricks. I'm Jamie and today we're going to conclude Season 1 of the Adventures Retrospective series by taking a look at the number one set on my wish list in 1998, The Pharaoh's Forbidden Ruins, also known as the Temple of Anubis. Set number 5988, it contains 711 pieces, 10 minifigures, and retailed in the US for $80. I've got the instructions here, showcasing the box art on the front, and a few alternate builds on the back. This one is interesting. I wonder where they got the idea for that big rolling boulder. Anyway, you didn't come here to look at a book, so let's get right into it. And here she is. Over the last 10 episodes, this is what we've been building up to, quite literally, and it's a beauty. I'd like to start with how our heroes got here, and this set actually offers two modes of transportation. First, we have this awesome hot air balloon. It's not something you see all that often in LEGO, even to this day, and it's a nice change of pace. The balloon itself is made up of just two large half-sphere elements with a Technic axle running through the center. And I like this detail of the netting on top, which really gives this an old-school feel. The basket features sandbags on each corner for ballast, or for dropping on the enemy, and it's suspended from the balloon by these four rigging pieces, any one of which can be open for placing your minifigures inside. You've got enough room to comfortably accommodate three heroes, possibly four if you get a little creative, and there's also a barrel for stowing tools and weapons. I really like this fuel tank build. It's simple, but looks great, and the flexible hose connecting to the burner is also a nice touch. There's also a lever here for controlling the flame. This thing is a lot of fun to play around with, especially when it comes to displaying minifigures. And of course, we need an experienced pilot at the helm, so we get the one and only Harry Kane. He's decked out in his trademark flight cap, bomber jacket, and black pants. As I've stated before, there's only one iteration of Harry across all the adventurer's sub-themes, so what you see here is what you get as far as he goes. And per the norm for this era of LEGO, there are no alternate expressions or rear torso printing for any of the minifigures included in this set. And the rest of the gang is here as well. In fact, this is the only set in which you get every major character in the theme. Of course, Johnny Thunder is leading our heroes into the Forbidden Ruins, and he's decked out in his iconic desert getup, with brown slouch hat, tan shirt with red bandana and printed revolver, and black pants. He's also given a real revolver, just in case he has trouble getting the printed one out of his belt. Doc Lightning, as usual, gets the most accessories, including his trusty magnifying glass, a working backpack for storing small accessories, like this printed bundle of dynamite, a pickaxe, and a skillet. He's also in charge of the map, which bears the Horus-style print. It's the only map we get in this set, but that's because its red X marks the final destination on our tour of Ancient Egypt. And rounding out our party of brave explorers is Miss Gail Storm, the journalist. This is only one of two sets in which you get Miss Storm, making her the least common of the wave. She's given a movie camera for documenting the trek into the ruins, and it comes loaded with a printed film tile featuring Johnny and Doc hard at work. She wears a white pith helmet and a tan shirt with bandana, compass, and red belt. Also notice the blue undershirt here. There was some confusion over the minifigure featured in episode 10, The Sphinx Secret Surprise, in which the blue shirt was missing, and after a bit of research, I'm beginning to think that this version is a printing variant rather than an intentionally different torso. A quick search on BrickLink revealed that there is no official entry for this print without the blue undershirt across all the adventurer's themes, or any other LEGO themes for that matter. At least not that I could find. If any of you have any more info on this, feel free to share in the comments. The second vehicle we get is one of my top three favorites in the series, probably because it reminds me a lot of the truck in Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's a six-wheeler and offers a ton of cargo capacity thanks to this large bed equipped with not one but two storage crates. And you have just about every accessory you'd want here. Rifles, a pickaxe, a cutlass, a pair of black binoculars, and even a coffee mug. 
Below the bed, we'll find a pair of tail lights and a printed license plate tile. The cab uses the two-man single-piece body element and features a roof, which I like the thought of, but the execution of its design is the one thing I'm not crazy about. In order for your minifigures to fit, the roof has to be raised up to a point where you've got this substantial gap between it and the windshield. To me, it just seems like there could have been a better way to design this. But everything else here looks great. Inside, of course, you have your steering wheel and shifter, as well as the printed console tile we've seen in so many of the Adventures vehicles. Below the cab are the fuel tanks, one on each side, and the nose of the truck makes use of this single piece grill and this rounded brick representing the hood. And at the very front you have a chain for pulling out heavy artifacts, or maybe just for subduing the villains. Like I said, this is one of my favorite vehicles in the theme. It's the largest by far, and just seems more grounded in reality when compared to the other cars and trucks, apart from that pesky windshield gap. And while we've got them captive, let's take a look at our villains. They're both the same versions we've seen many times before, but it's safe to say this set wouldn't be complete without them. Sam Sinister is looking fiendishly dapper in his top hat and black suit, and his flunky, Baron Von Baron, is keeping things pretty formal as well, with those white epaulets and exquisitely maintained mustache. And now, finally, we get to the main attraction, in all of its magnificent glory. There's so many details to look at here, it's hard to know where to start. One thing should be mentioned right off the bat, though. There are no stickers in this set, so all of the graphics you see here are printed elements, which in my eyes is a big bonus. The temple is actually split into two 16 by 32 sections between the entrance and the treasure room, so let's take a look at them individually. As far as this set goes, the front facade is the obvious winner when it comes to grabbing attention. Beginning at the top, you can see some semblance of a pyramid shape with these palisade bricks stepped up to a point, and two birds flanking a dark gray sarcophagus lid, meant to represent a stone carving. This lid is set exclusive, not offered in this color anywhere else. And since it's the old dark gray, it never will be. The carving rests on the 1x16 winged sun brick. You got a bit of a gap here between these two tan rock pieces, but below that is where the fun really begins. It's hard not to notice that the entrance is in fact the gaping maw of some sort of beast. At first I always thought it was a lion, but that never made too much sense to me in this setting, and after learning that this set is also known as the Temple of Anubis, I'm not sure that this isn't meant to represent a jackal. Either way, it's pretty menacing. Those translucent red eyes and killer teeth would be enough to keep me out of here. On either side of the beast are two pairs of large printed panels, each one unique and obviously exclusive to this set. We could spend an hour looking at all the detailed hieroglyphics here, and it's amazing to me now that LEGO put this much time and effort into these. Definitely one of the standout features of the entire set. Along each side, you've got two more birds, as well as a few bits of color and texture in these one by one round bricks. And then we get to the desert floor, where we'll find a classic palm tree, a very small campsite, and an obelisk featuring even more printed bricks. You'll notice that the hieroglyphics on the top cartouche here actually correspond to the ones we saw in the bottom right corner of the map. And then we have the doorway to the temple, which is guarded by two skeletons, one on each side. Nothing too special about these guys, and it would have been nice if they wore headdresses and had some sort of staff or weapon, but those are easy additions to make. To find out what they're guarding, we can spin this around to reveal the interior. As you can see, there are two levels here, and right away we have two more printed bricks built into these support pillars. All told, there are 17 printed elements in this set. Nowadays, we're lucky to get one or two, and the rest would be stickers. It's just one more thing that makes this set so special. The first thing to greet any would-be trespassers is a one-two punch booby trap. You've no doubt noticed the halberd here, attached to this chain running up to the ceiling, where we'll see these two red studs sticking out. If we pull the one on the right, 
Not only does it drop the halberd, it unloads a ton of rocks through a trap door in the roof. They're obviously just 2x2 two two bricks, but <laughs> you get the idea. In this little alcove to our right, we'll find a beautifully decorated sarcophagus. It's the same one we've seen in several previous episodes, but it still looks amazing. And it's extra special, because if we crack it open, we'll find that it's the final resting place of the one and only Pharaoh Hotep. As usual, he looks fantastic. His printing details still hold up pretty well to this day, and that face is as mischievously menacing as always. And in this set, he's actually given a scepter to wield. We'll leave him to lie in wait in the shadows and move to the opposite side of the interior. You have a ladder here, leading to the second floor, but there's another alcove behind it. This time though, there's nothing to see, which is a bit disappointing, but if you have some extra pieces and use your imagination, this area is ripe for customizing. I'm actually adding a snake pit to mine, using spares from my own collection, because if we ascend the ladder, we're going to land right on top of a trap door which is what this other pin activates. You could also add some spikes down here, or scorpions, or skeletons, or anything else unpleasant you can think of for grave robbers to fall into. But Johnny Thunder is no grave robber, and he's way too smart to step on a trap door, so once he gets across the top here, he'll be rewarded for his efforts in the form of this treasure chest, once he shoes the gray bat away, of course. Per the instructions, there are four gold coins in here, but since our heroes have come so far and overcome so many obstacles, I've decided to make it a little more worth their while. Maybe even more than worth their while. As I've said before, you can never have too much Lego gold. But that's about it for the front of the tomb. Now let's get to the place where this entire adventure has been leading to, the treasure room. It's an open air affair with these pillared walls providing most of the enclosure, and you have a few bushes on either side. I also like how this palm tree comes up over the wall on the left, adding a bit of asymmetry to an otherwise almost entirely symmetrical build. There are some creatures included that you can scatter about here, a scorpion, two black snakes, and one red snake. We also have two crocodiles, although they're just meant to be statues being molded in dark gray, which makes them both set exclusive. They're otherwise identical to the classic green crocodile, so their jaws and tails are still articulated for posing them however you see fit. Each one has a table built onto their back, which is identical between the two save for these translucent round bricks. The one on the left gets green, while the one on the right gets red. Each has a black chalice and a white scroll tile, which is reused from the old castle sets. I think a tile depicting hieroglyphics on papyrus would have been a bit more fitting, but if there's one thing I'm not going to complain about in this set, it's the prints. Front and center, we'll find this small build featuring two more scorpions, and just behind that is something we'll get back to in a second. The rear wall has some very nice detailing, including these two statues of Anubis on each side. I had fun building these, and I like how they add a lot of presence to the room. The center of the wall is topped off with two more gray birds, as well as the pharaoh's curse tile. We've seen it many times before throughout this series, but I'm glad to have it here at the end of our journey. And speaking of the end of our journey, here it is, the mythical Regal Ruby. The backstory is that whoever possesses it will be granted magical powers and eternal life, which explains why Pharaoh Hotep is still able to run and jump around at 3,000 years of age. But he has one final surprise for anyone trying to steal his source of power. I'm sure you've noticed this simple skeleton standing guard here, and while he's pretty run-of-the-mill, it's not your average wall that he's leaning against. It's actually a rotating wall, and if we spin it around, it snatches the ruby away from whoever tries to take it. I think the idea here is that you rotate this twice, quickly, so the ruby disappears completely. It's all done with pretty powerful little magnets. So will Johnny get his hands on the Regal Ruby after all, or will Pharaoh Hotep continue to lurk in the shadows of his ancient empire? That's up to you to decide. When all is said and done, I think it's safe to say we saved the best for last. This set instantly became the centerpiece on my adventure's Egyptian shelf, and deservedly so. The design itself is impressive and unique, 
And that, combined with two vehicles, 10 minifigures, tons of accessories, lots of awesome action features, and endless play scenarios make this set, in my humble opinion, the best in the wave. It gets a definite recommend for me. If you'd like to add it to your collection, a used set is typically going to run between $100 or $125, but if you're patient, you can find it cheaper. This one came from eBay, and it was listed about 95% complete, but I was able to snag it with the box and instructions for a mere $40. I promptly replaced the missing pieces using BrickLink for less than $5. Needless to say, this is one of my best LEGO scores to date. Over the past 11 episodes, we've taken a very close look at Johnny Thunder's quest for the Ray Gal Ruby, but the adventurer's adventure is far from over. Johnny and the gang will return in Season 2 of the Adventurer's Retrospective series, where we'll follow them deep into the heart of the Amazon as they attempt to retrieve the mythical Sun Disk. But I'll have to ask for your patience. I don't currently own any jungle sets, so in the meantime, we're going to dive into another classic 90s theme. Be sure to stay tuned till the end of this video for an exclusive first look at the next Trick Bricks Retrospective. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, be sure to click that subscribe button. So once again, this has been Jamie for Trick Bricks. Thanks for watching, and until next time, take care everybody, and play well!